Very excited. Uh, here she is. Ah, there we go. Thanks, everyone. That's a little awkward to come on stage and introduced, I think. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that by starting with a story. Um, kind of a typical moment, but the moment of my mental break that got me to the point to do this research. So it, and you know, an evening, not too long, like a year or so ago, and I'm at home with my family, my oldest daughters upstairs, putting lots of post-its on the wall and planning things and achieving stuff. And she, of course, has her computer and her phone, and I can even hear the vibrating of the text messages coming in. Um, and then, you know, I'm sitting downstairs with my other two daughters, one is on her phone with her headphones on. She's listening to music. She's flipping through Instagram. My other one, the list, uh, ha is sitting next to me on her iPad, and she's playing Toka Town or something like that and singing a little happy song to herself, something like, it's my time, my time to shine, or something along that lines. And um, <laughs> my husband is at his desk. He's a programmer, so, you know, code things on the screen. And I'm sitting on the couch, and, I, you know, end of the day, so I'm looking at Facebook. The theater of, of our lives <laughs> played out on Facebook. And, um, you know, I see a post from a friend of mine about how, Technology is so bad for our kids, and it's so wrong. And other friends are chiming in. They're like, oh, only let my kid play with wooden blocks until they're the age of four, or whatever, you know, this kind of mommier-than-thou attitude. Like, I would never, ever let my kid do this. And of course, they're all sitting at home with the TV on and their kids on the iPad watching the computers. And I usually don't get involved in this kind of stuff. But I was like, you know what, let me read the article that she linked to, this friend of mine. And it's, you know, Huffington Post. <laughs> so I go and I look at it, and it cites about nine different sources, one of which is about smartphones or tablets or computers or anything. It's all about TV. So I debate things, but I debate. And I say, oh, this is, you know, it's an interesting discussion, but the research you're referring to really doesn't have anything to do with technology. And then, like, nothing happens. There's this pause, and I'm like, shit. <laughs> and then an explosion of posts and posts, and it's like sort of backing out, you know, I've like instigated this. I'm just observing what's happening, you know. So this is it. This, this paradox that we have, this was my mental break, because I'm a researcher, um, and so what that means is I'm talking to people every day about how they're using technology, how they're creating it into their lives, how they're confronting all of these changes every day. And it is a disconnect for me. And so I had to dig deeper. So I'm going to take you guys on my journey. And it looks really bad right here. Okay. So, but don't cut out on me. I'm going for like a Stockholm drum effect. Lots of doors back there. Um, where we're all going to stay, come through this together, and hopefully with some principles of how we can pursue happiness and create happiness for the people that are experiencing the technologies that we create. But first, I had to do kind of an, an overview of the research to the great Google machine, obviously. And I typed in technology and happiness. And then I typed in, just for fun, technology and unhappy. Much got the same results. And it went into these few categories. So the first is technology distracts us. We all suddenly have ADHD. We're not in the moment anymore. We're distracted. In fact, it reminds me. Um, Oh, God. <laughs> I won't look at that right now. I just want to take a picture of you guys right now. It's like, why should I be on stage, you know? 
Do I really deserve this? No. You guys are the cool ones. So I'll tweet these out later. All right. <laughs> so there's action. Loneliness, right? And so there's some academic literature on this. If you've read Together Alone by Sherry Turkle, you know that we're all connected from each other. We're looking at our phones. We're not talking. We're in Japan. We're hanging out with fuzzy, adorable robot baby seals. That actually sounds kind of good. <laughs> but anyway, so the, another narrative. Reality is distorted. I just saw the other day a really funny video about like what Facebook posts look like and then what it's like in real life. But we all have that a little bit, right? It kind of puts things out of whack. And we know there's a little bit of, um, you know, not quite reality there. Then finally, you know, there's the Nicholas Carr argument that it just makes us so stupid. We don't more, we're not reading, we are, you know, we're just degenerating, basically. In fact, we give it condition names, like nomophobia. This is from, I was having a conversation with some friends at a restaurant, and I was saying, you know, and we were all debating whether to put down our phones or not. And, you know, that we were talking about our attachment to our phones. And I said, oh, yeah, it's a condition now. It's named nomophobia. And the waitress comes by, and she's like, oh, my God, I have that. I have that condition. <laughs> um, you know, this addiction narrative, there's detox camps for technology now. because, And we're, we play a part of this user experience, right? The technology is in control. The users are the subjects, they're the addicts, they're the, the people that are, are slaves to technology, right? So there's that. So we want to be really awesome. It's kind of a resemblance. Do you see this, Mike and that? <laughs> but we're not quite, we're not quite at the point. And we ha are really bad at imagining what happiness might look like with technology. It's usually technology doing things that we don't want to do or doing things that maybe we can't find anyone to do with us. Um, so, and, so it starts off great, you know, that looks pretty awesome. But then it ends like this, not good, right? So then I'm like, okay, that's a lot of unhappiness. That's a lot of misery. I'm interested in what makes people happy. And so I, at first I had to think like, okay, what have I seen? And one thing I do in a lot of my research is one of these silly exercises, you personify your devices. And so a lot of times I'll ask people, so apt was a person, who would that be? And I don't know, you guys toss question, who would your laptop be if it was a person? Who? <laughs> well, most people say it would be a colleague or kindly uncle, maybe. You ask about a phone, and people are like, oh, yeah, that would be, that's like my best friend. That's my soulmate. I had one guy who's so cute, because I do a lot of research with Gen Z, and he's like, if I could marry my phone, I would. <laughs> and, oh, you're adorable. You, I kind of think of it as a pet, and I, I put it up there on the, on the graph, right? I mean, phones are pretty awesome, and because we're touching them all the time, we're super attached to them in a way that we aren't with our other devices. So there's that. And then I had to think back to all my happy, my personal happy moments with technology. You know, so if you guys think about that, you're thinking about like, Oh, yeah, you know, well, there's porn. <laughs> we won't talk about that one. Um, but, you know, you guys have some similar ones to mine. Going to Amazon for the first time. I treasured my mug that I got for being, like, one of the first Amazon buyers. That was so awesome. My Pets.com sock puppet, I forgot today, but it still works. He's a happy puppy thing. Look it up on YouTube for those of you too young to remember Pets. Um, um, there's, you know, the fetus timeline. I don't know if anyone here has been pregnant. Um, it's really good until you get to the pumpkin phase, and then you're like, no, I don't want to look at that timeline anymore. <laughs> it's too disturbing. So most of these moments are divided between, like, maker moments 
and experiencing moments. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting somewhere. I'm getting somewhere with this whole happiness thing. And there have been a few studies. It's, you know, they're big studies about life satisfaction. They're global happiness indexes. Bhutan started this um, because, you know, their gross national product is not so impressive. So like, okay, let's measure gross national happiness. And um, now technology is getting to be on the radar with that. And it does have an impact, especially in developing companies, just countries, just the access to technology. And then there's just awesomeness like this. So I'm like, okay, happiness has to be in the picture, they have to go together, but how am I gonna learn about this? All right, so first we could just ask people, right? And we kind of, in our field, we have a sort of a bias against asking people because we think, well, people don't, can't really articulate what they're gonna say, they don't know. But in fact, you know, this is a lot of the happiness research that has been done based on surveys. There's about 1,500 different survey instruments developed to measure and assess happiness. Um, there are things like interviews. So I give this a two Neil deGrasse Tyson rating on the science ometer, okay, for surveys and interviews. We could observe, and so that's really great because we'll get a sense of what people do. And diaries are a big part of Dan Kahneman's work on experiencing um, self versus remembering self. He learned that through a diary study. He's a big positive scientist. Searcher. That seems legit. I'm going to put that further up the, the NDG scale. And then finally, we can track. This is new, right? The idea that we can actually track our happiness with our phones. I do it. Um, with um, sensors, with all kinds of technology, eye tracking even. But it's a little kludgy, and it's usually combined with something else to really work. And then finally, there's social listening, um, which can be good depending on how you factor it in. It's really designed for brands more than big concepts. So if you don't have a good hashtag associated with it or a good brand, it gets a little tricky. So I only give that two Niels. Um, so I'm going to do all of this because it's about science, right? I did all this stuff here <laughs> for the, to learn happiness, OK? Online study is kind of a combo of like survey, observation, recording people, talking about it. So that's kind of a mixed bag. So, and I'm going to start with that because my first real question is, OK, does happiness actually even matter to the experience people have with technology? My sense is, yes, it does. So I looked at our online study. We had this crazy idea a couple years ago that we wanted to create a data set about the experience people have with studies. And so we started tracking about 20 different metrics for all these different sites, top sites, sites that you know, Amazon, Zappos, you know, whatever, Travelocity. Some of them were ease of use kind of things, like task success or time on task or feeling of success, even a subjective measure. Some were engagement related. And I stuck happiness in there because I was like, I want to learn about happiness. But other things like time and you know, um, page depth and things like that. And then finally, some that were related to what are they going to do after this experience? Are they going to recommend it? Are they going to come back? Do they trust it? All those factors. When we looked at that, it got really, really interesting. First of all, happiness really tracked to thinking a site is better than other sites. So after people had an experience of using a site, Think about this. They've used a site for like 10 minutes, a little attenuated from what you'd really use a website, which would be much less time. Their feet, it correlates, I mean, that site is better. Oh, it also correlates to likelihood to return to that site. It correlates to recommending that site. And then I was like, let's cross check this a little bit. So I went and looked at all of our top sites that kind of rose to the top in the study against socialism, because social listening is great for that kind of thing. And it aligned. The sites that ranked as happy in our data set were the ones that had a strong, positive social sentiment score. So I was like, holy, this is amazing. This might be the only metric 
that really matters, if you're only gonna track one thing about user experience, oh shit, I said the word user, I didn't mean to say that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> if you're only gonna track one thing, happiness might be the thing. Because yeah, you're asking people and they're reporting it, but when somebody asks if you're happy or not, you pretty much know if you are or not. So um, that's what all the happy research kind of relies upon. But like most data, it wasn't all neat and tidy. So we saw something like this. So we have Expedia on the side and we have Hipmunk on the other side. Now, which do you guys think made people happier? We have people laughing because it seems so obvious, right? Which one? Just kidding. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hipmunk, yeah. That's what I thought too. That's what everyone at our, in our groups thought. We're like, Hipmunk, that's it's cute, it's light, it's well designed, it's beautiful. No. <laughs> and so obviously I was like, okay, I need to understand a little more about what happiness is. What does happiness mean? And so here's when I got to more survey and diary study work with folks to figure out what does this mean? I mean, there's a lot of different models of happiness. There's riffs. This is a variation on Maslow's. I added the Wi-Fi part of it. <laughs> but this is Maslow's hierarchy. They all contain these kind of same things. In our field, we think Deloitte, right? <laughs> this is what we're all about. That's why we're um, <laughs> But really, there's kind of a wide range of happinesses. There's a lot of different intensity levels of happiness that we need to think about. There are different ways of expressing happiness. Now, I've started to dive into this with our diary studies where we preface all the work that we're going to do with them of giving them kind of a happiness um, barometer. We use the Oxford happiness um, uh, questionnaire as our basis for that. And we found that the people that are happier, report themselves as happier in that questionnaire, do have more happy moments. They are recommending more. They're doing more happy stuff. They're also listening to more music and they seem to be more connected on social media. But I don't really, I feel like I have quite enough data to lay that out there. But there are clear indications that there are some people who are just happier in general. So you probably, like if you're married, you probably have one of each, right? Like I'm the happy one. Your husband's the less happy one. Yeah, see me on the one, probably. Um, <laughs> okay. And we have, some things are just built in. We have set points. We have a genetic set point of happiness. We have circumstances. This is from Sonia Lubomirsky's research. You know, these are rough. It's not exact, but 10% circumstances mean if you are not, if you don't have food, if you don't have shelter, if you can't take your basic needs, you're not going to be as happy. But there's still 40% that we can, we can do, that we can change. So let's all silently judge that. Let's all silently judge this site. Just a number in your head, one to five range, one the lowest, five the highest. Don't alter your number as soon as people start to shout them out. So, all right, here, I'm looking at you. You're, you rated it in your head, like, right away. Four. Anyone else? Two. Two. I gave it a five when it first came out. Yeah, Abby. <laughs> Three. <laughs> I give it a zero because <laughs> I never... <laughs> but, but as you can see, it's a little subjective, just rating purely on happiness, right? So maybe that's a little too simplistic. And when you ask people, again, here's where this idea that comes in that we're poor predictors of happiness. People say stuff like this, oh, I just want it to be pretty, you know, just colorful. Like, I, I do a lot of work, financial, like boring products, financial services and, and pharma and healthcare and stuff like that. I was like, oh, why are the colors, you know? <laughs> and it's like, this is the, the idea that I have a design. Designers, we think this. This is from Shutterstock. Every year, they gather all their data of, like, what everybody searches. So it's interesting to see how it 
changes a little bit from year to year, but this is kind of where we're at right now, state of the art design happiness. Okay, you guys are all out there, you're like, yes! So awesome, <laughs> low poly. Okay, um, and, and in our process, we even have a place for it. I saw a few weeks ago, somebody put together this great grid of like all the steps in the user experience process. And at the very end, right before like analyzing the success of the site, there was this layer of and it was all micro interactions, micro content, micro this, micro that. Um, that's, where we're, that's where we're at. This. Delight's a little tricky if we just focus on that, right? Can you guys see the delightful detail on this screen? It's supposed to be the little guys in the seats. <laughs> but, but most everyone missed that, like real people who aren't designers, <laughs> miss stuff like that. Um, little things like this that people think are funny, but it sort of like misses the point, right? I love the ACK. But then details can matter, right? So you have some something like this where it's like, okay, this was this was small. This delighted me though, because it, it got to me right on time. And you know, if you do track all these little kind of moments, this is a typical pattern that we see among the moments that people have. It's like it goes up and then it just kind of these little blips. And at the end, it sort of ends up to to happiness. But then we confront the other problem. People don't remember anything. So I did a series of exercises. This is one of the kind of interview experiences, you know, experiences I did, having people draw their favorite site. So like, okay, here's a site that you use, that you love, an app you love, and you've told me it's, it makes you happy, and we've broken down as part of this interview all the ways it makes you happy. Can you just draw it for me? You know, and so we want to understand, let's, go, let's skip to this. There's kind of a design fog. What people draw most often is the logo or the little app icon that they have on their phone. That's, that's it. That's all they're taking away from the design. Yeah, this is a little better. This is very typical Netflix drawing there, if you can't tell what that is. This is pretty good. This is one of the more detailed ones. So what we see is people aren't remembering so much, well, so much of the design. They're remembering what's important to them, and then they're remembering that feeling that they took away from the experience. Okay, so can we create happiness? A big question, right? Because that's what we want to do. We don't want to just reduce the suffering of people. Well, we do, but we don't want to focus only on that. How can we do it? So happiness is this loose concept. So what I did is ask people, okay, how does this site that makes you so happy make you really feel? And I did it in two ways. First, I asked kind of closed-ended and gave them these choices. And then I asked open-ended to see like, okay, would they come up with the same words that I came up with? And it was pretty close. And it tracked to all these categories. So I broke it down further. This is the IA part of it. This is a part of my talk. <laughs> Into five categories. <laughs> the first one. Ease of use. This is kind of like that 10% circumstance measure of happiness. What we found is that without ease of use, and in our, in our model, in our online studies, we're on a 100-point scale, so it has to be slightly above mediocre on 65. If you don't have that on any of the ease of use measures, like time on task or success or feeling like you're able to do what you need to do, you're not going to have happiness. So it's like your meal is edible, you know. It's that first stage of happiness. You have over that to make it there. Um, healthcare.gov is a site that we've looked at many times, and you can see this is the first time out 
they were way down there on happiness. So that was whenever it first launched in October. After they made changes, we looked at it again. Happiness went up because a lot of their ease of use measures went up, but not much else. And then it kind of plateaued because they didn't go beyond ease of use and, and helping with that. So I think that gives us a demonstration of ease of use is kind of this building block, but it's a hurdle that you have to go over. So there's a lot of different components, though, related to ease of use. I think autonomy is one of them. So we can look at a site like Zappos, which is one of the happiest sites in our data set, and look at it and be like, eh, as a designer. Okay, it gets where we need. But there's something to the idea that I can do this. It's familiar to me. It looks like other sites I'm familiar with. It's making me feel like I don't need help stuff done. Because more time it takes to do anything reduces the amount of happiness. Now, you know, certain things, I love this, this guy. This was a guy I talked to who's a Latin teacher at a private school. So he said, oh, it takes a certain amount of Pavlovian conditioning to use a certain aspect of the site. Can you, can you guess what it is on this screen? It's a hamburger menu. Oh. <laughs> so ease of use also relates to kind of this feeling of control, right? Thick principle. And if you look at a lot of the happiness models for personal happiness, not just happiness with design or happiness with technology, part of it. I think that can kind of tip it over the edge with ease of use is actually not quite so easy to use. And we've found this a lot, and it's something I want to explore a little more, this idea of being able to master something. So here's somebody's diary submission. They finally figured out how to get the remote to work with their Apple TV. And then he went over to like his parents' house and did it and had them cancel cable to boot, and then went to his friend's house and set it up. So Mastery is really powerful, and it's connected to this ease of use in some way. Okay, second, trust, another building block. So there's a lot of ways we can signal trust with design, right? It's The design looks professional, it looks legit, there are various trust markers, we all know about that. It turns out really, really important. Like This is almost, it's a little above ease of use, but you can't have happiness without some basic level of trust. And you can show this in a lot of ways. It's respecting the humanity of the individual coming to your site, using your app, knowing the boundaries, showing that little extra bit of care. You can't really see it very well in here. Usually I bring my, these are my brainwave cat ears, which I love. Um, but it shows I purchased it, right? Because sometimes you, and that, those little details, that's where a delightful detail comes in. Oh, that reminds me in with my mood ring people yet. How's it looking? Blue, hopefully. Blue, okay. <laughs> so, if you're going to use a device that's controlling your house, you've got to have some trust, right? This was something that came up uh, in our diary studies with folks who were using devices in various ways in their homes. It's huge, huge impact. No happiness. There wasn't trust. Um, and there's a little bit of authenticity comes into this picture, too. People want to feel like there was a human designing the thing, whatever it is. There's some glimmer of humanity in there, right? I mean, maybe it's our deep-seated fear of the robot apocalypse, but that's a huge element of trust. Okay, next building block is creativity. And you say, creativity? Like, yeah, we've got that because we're designers and all, you know, <laughs> we're awesome, but what about regular? Well, it's huge. I mean, this is what's tipping it over the edge. So you have ease of use as a building block, trust is a building block. This is where you're really getting to happiness, where you have people that can actually create things and then share them with other people, but it can be simple too. This is one that from our online studies that achieved a very high happiness rating because of this element of play without a credit hit. Because that's what happens a lot when you try to play around with numbers. 
websites is they start sending your numbers to the credit agencies and it, it freaks people out. Um, or seeing evidence, again, that other humans have been there and thought about the same things is a little small to see, but showing the top searches on WebMD was a huge happiness factor in that, in that site. It's just showing that presence of other people and, oh, they're like me. They're thinking about the same things as me. There's also that feeling of like, they're kind of weird. I'm better than them. <laughs> that plays into it as well. Um, I just like that. <laughs> just take that in for a minute. It's coming. And then finally, the last aspect of creativity is this idea that of, of newness, of something that's a little bit different, right? We like the things that are familiar, like Zappos or Amazon, because we know how to use them and we know what we're getting into, but we tire of it. It's called hedonic adaptation in the happiness literature, and it is the same with design. So YouTube is one that came up a lot under this because of suggesting new things. Shazam is another one. There's a lot of, a lot of sites that kind of play into that piece of it. That is that's my next example. Okay, connection. This is really important because, like I said earlier, we have to know that humans are in there and this is what makes people really, really happy. So the other thing I kind of do, this is less scientific, is I sort of stalk people because I travel a lot <laughs> and I'm going a lot of different places and I'm going out to you know various events. I observe and I note down on a huge Excel grid what people do. So are they on their phone? Are they standing? Are they sitting? Are they hunched over in a closed posture? Are they open posture? Are they showing somebody? Laughing? Are they smiling? A lot of times I'll sidle around behind them. Be like, hmm. And then sometimes they'll ask me, well, what are you doing, creepy person? And, and I'll be like, oh, well, actually, I'm just really interested. And then we'll talk about it and have a conversation. But what I notice is when people are smiling, like actually smiling, it's because they're doing something where they're connecting with another person. They're on the phone, they're texting, they're on social media. So hugely, hugely important. Yes, it's a little bit about likes. It's a lot about love-mindedness. This is a cat person posting out to her cat community of cat friends. These are actually, and Gary are cats, by the way. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's made too. So this is also from the diary study, and this fellow was learning Italian, connected with people in Italy, then helped them to, to go to New Zealand, and it just kind of snowballed, and he met more people, and they ended up helping each other, and it was a huge factor in happiness. There's this idea of like-mindedness, you know, giving evidence like, hey, you're cool, I'm cool, we're cool together kind of thing. And some sites definitely have that. We saw that with Apple when we talked to people about the site, and it did rate really for happiness. And then there's this, this idea of really helping other people. And that kind of taps into the last layer of happiness, which is meaning. The big one, <laughs> right? And connection is a part of it but it's learning so much of people's pleasure and purpose with technology, because happiness is pleasure and purpose is learning. It's feeling this kind of flow, not just a flow state that you get into when you're working. The guy with the other unpronounceable Slavic last name <laughs> has said, I feel great empathy for him. Um, but also this kind of flow between real life and technology, because there is no divide anymore. People don't see it that way. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm gonna unplug the phone and plug in the modem and go online now. You know, those those are over. And, you know, get kind of this glimpse of some higher purpose. I can't tell you how many times Humans of New York came up in all of our studies. That guy love that guy. He's given us all like meaning back to our lives. But I think it's because the idea that we're connecting people with stories because it's really 
a huge part of our happiness online is about narrative. So we have these five factors, and there's no cut and dried approach to any of the principles, right? But these are things that we should be tracking, be designing for, that we should be looking for. So, since we've all made it to this point, I would like you all to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear to all the superstars in this room who not to Pamela, my new awesome friend, <laughs> that I will always, always practice happiness first design. With the power vested in me, I declare you an awesome audience, and thank you very much. Wait, should we do questions? We have time for a couple questions. I thought you guys would enjoy looking at my puppy while we answered questions. I know, she's so cute, except when she's peeing all over the floor. OK, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is there a methodology or approach that you recommend to sort of, how do I put this, almost like as if it was a pass the design, right? You sort of get the roughs down, and then you sort of look for inconsistencies, then you check for logic errors. And then you check for happiness kind of thing? Like, is there some well, approaches you recommend? I think it's two things. I think the first one is that this should be something we're tracking. We're tracking, you know, net promoter score, for God's sake. We're tracking all crazy stuff. Why aren't we tracking happiness? Because it, we know now with, I mean, it's a fairly large data set that we know that it has an impact on all they're good things, why would we not do that? So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that looking at these five building blocks, we have to say, okay, let's set up some kind of where we test those building blocks, where we say, have we achieved that? And have we, you know, confirmed that with real people who are using our site? And there's a lot of ways to bring in real people, right? As you saw in this approach, it's blended. It's you know, big data through social listening. It's um, diary studies, some online, some in-person interviews. There's surveys. It's, it's a whole variety of approaches. I don't think there's one right way to get that information. I think you almost have to take that because it's, it's complicated. Yeah, um, thank you. One thing I was struck by is the extent to which happiness um, is so often not about what's on the page, and you were really focusing on the page. When I, I talk to people about what makes what they love about Zappos, yeah. it's, oh, it has my shoes for cheap, they come in two days, and I can return them for free. When you talk about what, pe pe what made people unhappy with healthcare.gov, it was that it did not work. <laughs> it was not, ease of use doesn't matter if the back end systems have not been architected to talk to one another. And I felt like your talk it focused an awful lot on the design of the page, not enough on the sort of entire service. And I was wondering how you would tie that in to determining what happiness is rather than just focusing. Yeah, on I mean, on really, the page. like. Four of those factors, you know, trust, connection, creativity, meaning, are not tied specifically to a design element. You can't say, like, oh, it was so creative, you know. It, it doesn't quite track that way. So, the, you know, the science of happy design is not really about design, per se. It's about that experience. And when people look back on that happiness afterwards, like you saw in those drawings, they don't really remember much about the actual design itself, but about all these feelings that they have about it and they associate that experience. But I do think that said that there are certain things we can do with the design and track with the design that will help us to create more happiness because I think that's the goal. And yes, it's it's getting, you know, a good price and free shipping and stuff like that. But I have to believe that 
there are happy design moments as well wrapped up in that. Do we have one more or no? Okay. You commented towards the beginning that you track your own happiness. And as somebody who's a UX designer with a lot of interest and work in behavioral sciences, I'm wondering what you use to track your happiness, what you uh, found were, let's say, happiness trackers that you didn't like because they were just basically marketed as such. And if you found that once you started using it, knowing that you were tracking it, that self-knowledge, how that affected <laughs> your happiness. You could choose not to answer, but it's very specific. No, it's... It's funny because like everything that you try to do, at least for me, I don't know, maybe I'm not a very methodical person and kind of thing, but I start one thing, like I did 100 happy days for a while, and that's like posting a picture of someone who makes you happy every day with that hashtag, right? And I did that for a while, and then I missed a day, and I was like, oh, crap, I missed a day. No, I'm keep doing this. And then, then I did it again for a couple of days, and then I missed another day, and I'm like, that's it. I'm giving up now. <laughs> and then, uh, that, so that's just, you know, a hashtag, basically, to track your, and then you can go and see, like, on tag board or something like that, see everybody else's happy moments, which, of course, I pulled all that data out of there to see what those were. Not much about technology, actually. Those, but that's another topic. And then I've tried, like, Happify. I've tried Mood Panda. You saw it, um, a screen for that. Um, they all have their different advantages. Some are geared more toward making other people happy, like Mood Panda. You know, so if I ever put in, like, I was having a bad mood, people would be like, oh, no, don't have a bad mood. Oh, smile, be happy. And that annoyed me, and so I stopped tracking that because <laughs> I was like, I don't need your happiness pity. Um, <laughs> so and then Happier lets you kind of track moments. I've used to spell project to track them. And the pro a lot of the problem is just, you know, is consistency. And then, but like, I'm not really learning that much new about my, my happiness that way. I think maybe if there's something with biometrics factored in, that might be interesting. Um, I don't do, like, running or anything like that. I know a lot of people use fitness trackers in tandem with happiness tracking. And and that way, I tried, oops, I tried sleep trackers for a while, too. And that was like, I was like, yeah, I can see the pattern here. My kids are waking me up every night. <laughs> Can't fix it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you guys, I think that's, is that it for questions? It's time for lunch. It was so great talking to all of you guys. Thanks again. <laughs> All right, yeah, um, you know, everything's happening all at once. It's really great. Um, lunch, is, lunch is getting set up. It's basically going to start where Samantha's standing. So that's where the line's going to start. Uh, if you want to start lining up and come back towards me. So starting there, coming back towards me, line up. Uh, we have a, let me, oh, I'm going to switch to that slide. Because it's a nice slide, you know. See? But, um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a great lunch from Dos Toros, burritos. You can make your own burrito bowl. It's delicious. They're, you know, New York's own Chipotle. Um, oh. No, no, we're going to do it later.